Shabbat Shalom, Temple Yeshua, Shalom Havarim, Mashlom Hem. How are you guys doing? Good to see you again, even though I can't see you. I know you're there, and that warms my heart. So I'm going to be starting a two-part series on prophecy. I know you're studying the gifts of the Spirit, and prophecy is certainly uh, one of those gifts. And certainly there's a lot of talk about prophecy today and a real attempt to understand what the gift is about so that we can exercise it in the manner in which God wants us to. So we'll begin, I'll begin teaching on it and then I'll end the session and then I'll do another session, which you'll see next week. So the Hebrew word for prophet is navi, and it's taken from a verb, the nave, which means to prophesy. And this word originates from an ancient uh, Semitic language called Akkadian, which was the original language of Mesopotamia, which is modern day Iraq. And this was the place, of course, where the Assyrians lived and the Babylonians lived. This was the place where Abraham and his family came from. They came from Ur of the Chaldees. Um, so this language, Akkadian, or a derivative of it, was Abraham's native language. And maybe that's one reason why many of the words in Hebrew are derived even from this language. And this word for prophet, Navi, is taken from a verb, uh, Navu, which means to call or to proclaim, taken from a verb, which means to call or to proclaim. Now, we know that uh, at the very beginning, the prophet's uh, primary function under the old covenant was to serve as God's human messenger by proclaiming uh, and communicating God's word to his people. And we know that true prophets never spoke on their own authority. They never shared their own personal opinions, but they were obliged to speak the very message that God gave them. So it's extremely important to understand this, you know, this was what they did. And many texts make this clear. Like, for example, God promises Moses in Exodus 4.12, he says, now go. And I will help you speak. You remember Moses complained about the fact that he couldn't speak well. I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. Or in Jeremiah, here's Jeremiah. He's, uh, he's virtually a child. And the Lord says to him, I've put my words in your mouth. And basically, I'll tell you what to say. Same thing with Ezekiel. Ezekiel 2.7, you must speak my words to them. And I can go on and on and on in so many uh, of the prophetic books, begin with the words, the word of the Lord came to Hosea, Joel, Micah, Zephaniah, Jonah, or Amos proclaims, this is what the Lord says. Now, it's important for us to understand that this prophetic ministry was not always, how shall I say, restricted. The men in the days of the old covenant. Um, Mary, Moses' sister, Miriam, for example, is called the prophetess in Exodus 15 20, or Deborah is called a prophetess in Judges 4 4. And we read about a lady by the name of Huda in 2 Kings 22, and so on. We also read outside of the female prophetesses, we read of groups or bands of prophets that ministered in Israel in 2 Samuel, for example, 10.5 and 1 Kings 18.4. And they're often referred to as the company of the prophets. Now, it's important for us to understand the Bible does not exactly explain to us how the word of the Lord comes to a prophet. Sometimes it may come as an audible voice of God, or sometimes an internal one. But there are many, many instances in which the Lord real, reveals his will to his prophets through visions. We see this in 1 Samuel 3, where the Lord appears to Samuel as a child and 
reveals to him what's going to happen to Eli, the high priest and all of his descendants. Or in Isaiah 6, for example, we see an uh, extraordinary thing. Yeshiahu sees this vision of the Lord seated on his throne, seated in the temple, high and exalted and attended to by many seraphim. Ezekiel also sees some fascinating stuff. In Ezekiel 1, in the first chapter, he sees the visions of the Lord where he sees the cherubim, he sees the chariot of God and the very presence of God seated on his throne on this chariot being borne along by the seraphim. And another, another book which is filled with these kinds of visions is the book of Zechariah. And his prophecies detail his visions as well as uh, frequent encounters with angels of God. And we know, for example, that the Lord speaks to the prophets in dreams. The Lord speaking uh, through Moses declares to Aaron and his sister Miriam in Numbers 12, verse 6. When there is a prophet among you, the Lord says, I, the Lord, will reveal myself to them in vision, visions. I speak to them in dreams. You know, Joseph wasn't a prophet per se, but he had a prophetic gift. He could interpret dreams. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, many of them had notable dreams and notable visions. Now, the divine inspiration you might say and authority of the old testament the old covenant prophetic voice is affirmed in the new covenant scriptures here's something that uh, shimon says peter says in second peter ver uh, chapter 1 verses 20 and 21 he says no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things for prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, I have to tell you that those who spoke for God were held to a very strict standard of judgment in Old Covenant times. Even if an alleged prophet performed a sign or a wonder or accurately per predicted the future. But if he said, let us follow other gods, let us worship them. We see this in Deuteronomy 13 too. His words are to be absolutely rejected. And likewise, if the word he speaks does not take place or come true, obviously it's a message the Lord hasn't spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. Do not be in awe of him. Do not stay with him. But here's one. You know, we, we're going to take note of in a minute. Um, Jeremiah 14, 14. We're going to go back to Deuteronomy 18 in a minute because it says something very serious. The Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I've not signed. I've not sent them. I've not appointed them. I haven't spoken to them or through them. They are prophesying false visions, divinations, idolatries, and the delusions of their own minds. And God says he's against those who prophesy falsely. Because they cause people to because of their lies and their recklessness and that's usually the result of false, false prophecy people believe things and then do things that get them into trouble now the punishment for speaking falsely in the name of god or other gods was death let me say that again in Old Covenant times, the punishment for speaking falsely in the name of God or of other gods was death. Hear what Deuteronomy 18.20 says. It says, 
the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I've not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Okay. Now, there are two things here one has to do with speaking in the names of other gods. But here he says, a prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, shall die. And for example, we see a very, demonst a very extraordinary demonstration of this in First Kings chapter 18, where verse 40, where Elijah commands the people to seize the 400 and 50 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah and have them all slain after, of course, their gods could not send fire from heaven to consume their sacrifices. They were all put to death. So, you know, this is a serious, serious issue. Now, we begin to see the role of prophets begin to change a bit. After Samuel had anointed Saul, and throughout the time of Israel's monarchy, you know, when there were kings in Israel, prophets very often, very frequently advised the kings. They would deliver words of warning or words giving divine guidance or encouragement. And some examples, for example, some examples are Nathan, Nathan's word that stopped David from building the temple. In 2 Samuel 7, or his stern rebuke of David for his adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. And of course, complicity in the death of her husband in 2 Samuel 12. Or, for example, Yeshiahu uh, Isaiah bringing God's word to Hezekiah not to fear the Assyrians in Isaiah 19. When Jerusalem was virtually being threatened with destruction by the Assyrian armies. Or again, Isaiah brings the word to Hezekiah about his impending death in 2 Kings 20. And afterwards was sent by the Lord to bring him another word. That he would be healed. Now, when this type of word. Or prophecy is given to individuals, especially, for example, the one about Hezekiah's death, it falls more into the category of what we would call personal prophecy today, even though those individuals were heads of state and their decisions affected nations. Elijah's prophecy, for example, to the widow at Sarafat in 1 Kings 18, concerning her oil multiplying and her flowers so she and her son could survive the famine or Elisha's prophecy in 2 Kings 4 to uh, another poor widow whose oil was multiplied or his prophecy to the Shunammite again in 2 Kings 4 she couldn't conceive he declared she would become pregnant and give birth to a son or his prophecy, you know, concerning Naaman, the commander of the armies of Armea, promising he'd be healed of leprosy if he followed the prophet's instructions. We see this story in 2 Kings 5, verses 1 to 19. These all fall into the category of personal prophecies. Now, from the 8th century BC, onward, in other words, 800 years before Yeshua was born, the focus of the prophet's messages became much more general. Their words were directed both to the leaders of Israel and to the nation at large. <clears throat> but even though they made predictions about the destiny of Israel and sometimes the fate of the nations that surrounded them. Look, their primary role was to remind God's people of the holiness of God and exhort them strongly to fulfill their covenant obligations to him. 
they would denounce injustice and idolatry, empty ritualism in their religion and, and uh, the oppression of the poor in the nation. But their task was to call Israel to repentance and back to faithfulness to God. Now, there were two types of prophecies that the Hebrew prophets delivered to the people. Um, I've taught you about this before, I think. Some were conditional prophecies where a national disaster could be averted if the people repented of their ways. You know, we, the, our expulsion from our homeland, our national homeland, could have been prevented if we just would have remained faithful to God and obedient to his commandments. Look, this was prophesied. And this was, you know, this was that all these things were said before we even entered our homeland. You see it in Deuteronomy 28, you see it in Leviticus 26. These things could have been avoided if we would have obeyed God. They, but, and they were conditional on our repentance. But our regathering back to the land and our prosperity in the end of days as a people that the prophets predicted were not conditional prophecies. They were unconditional prophecies based on covenant promises that God made to the patriarchs. You know, God gave Abraham and his descendants unconditional title to the land of Canaan because of Abraham's faith, that he credited to him as righteousness. He promised to be our God and the God of our descendants. He promised through Avraham Avinu to make his descendants a blessing, his greatest descendant a blessing in all the earth and so on. And we see that prior to the exile, both exiles, both of the northern tribes and, of course, Judah and Benjamin. In light of what the prophets already knew about what lay ahead for the nation, its conquest by foreign powers, followed by our deportation and suffering in foreign lands, God encouraged us through the prophets by his promise of an event, uh, an eventual return to our homeland. And also spiritual renewal with great blessings to come. When Israel, when we as a people would once again trust God and obey him. I mean, the Bible is filled with these promises. You see it in Deuteronomy 30, 1 to 10, Isaiah 11, 10 to 16 in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, and so on and so forth. We see these promises over and over again, this promise of an eventual return to the homeland and spiritual renewal with great blessings to come. When Israel would once again trust God and obey him, I think of Ezekiel 36, where the Lord tells us these things and yet goes a step further. And says that he will give us the power to obey him. He will take the stony heart out of our flesh. And he will give us hearts of flesh. And put his spirit within us. And move us to obey his commandments. So he can fulfill the promises. That he made to Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Another thing you know the Bible also reveals about being God's mouthpiece. When what the scripture reveals is that it was often a dangerous calling because people frequently mocked and rejected and persecuted and even killed God's prophets. It says in 2 Chronicles 36, 16, but they mocked God's messengers 
They despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. And we see this frequently with the prophet Jeremiah. Poor guy, what he suffered. Quoting Jeremiah 11.21, it says, Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the people of Anatot who are threatening to kill you, saying, listen <clears throat> to what they said to Jeremiah. They said, do not prophesy in the name of the Lord or you will die by our hands. Or again, we see in Jeremiah 18.18, 18, it says, come, let's make plans against Jeremiah. Let's attack him with our tongues, in other words, slander him and pay no attention to anything that he says. And of course, there's Stefan, Stephanos, the Stephen, the first martyr, you might say, of the new covenant, Ecclesia. And he asked his persecutors, was there ever a prophet that your ancestors did not persecute? In Acts 752. Now it would be incorrect to say, as the early rabbis did, that all prophecies ceased in Israel after the Jews returned from exile in Babylon around 400 BC. And you know, it's it's like a truism in the body about this. Many of us are still being taught that this was the case, that the gift of prophecy was only restored when Yeshua, the Messiah, came and was given as a gift by the Holy Spirit to his followers thereafter. But I want you to know something, because you need to study the matter out. Prophecy did not cease between Malachi and the first Gospels. You see, the writer of Hebrews says something. He says, Yeshua, the Messiah, and I can put in brackets, who is God, is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews 13, 8. You have to become acquainted with some of the literature of that period between Malachi and, you know, the first Gospels to understand, if you have any discerning at all, that there is definitely inspiration and anointing on some of that stuff, not all of it, but certainly some of it. But because of the rabbi's decision, none of this extraordinary wealth of literature written during what some call the intertestamental period was believed to be divinely inspired and thus not included when the old covenant was first compiled in around 200 BCE. Now, the first prophetic voice in the Gospels, other than Yeshua himself, was Yohanan, was John, who ministered to the people in advance of the Lord's coming. He proclaimed that coming and prepared the people to meet the Lord. How? Through confession of sin and his baptism of repentance. In Luke, Chapter 1, verse 76, on the occasion of Yohanan's birth, his, his father, Zechariah, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he prophesied about his son, and he said, and you, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. And later, Yeshua said about his cousin John in Matthew 11, verse 9, he says to the people, what did you go out to see? A prophet? Oh, yes, I tell you. And more than a prophet. So the first prophetic voice we hear in this New Covenant era is the voice of Yohanan, John the Baptist. But on the day of Pentecost, on Shavuot, 10 days after Yeshua had ascended, when 120 of Yeshua's 
disciples were gathered in an upper room praying, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, fell on them in power, and they began to proclaim in languages they themselves had never learned the wonders of God. <laughs> they were doing so within the hearing of a, an audience, an amazed audience standing in the street below. And so when he's called on to uh, explain this strange and wonderful phenomenon, Shimon, Peter, declares that this is none other than the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy spoken long ago. Joel 2.28, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. So in essence, what Peter was doing was declaring something very revolutionary. That the gift of prophecy would no longer be confined to a small group of people whom God had specially chosen and anointed to speak on his behalf, as it was in days of old. I'm going to say that again. In essence, people, Peter was declaring that the gift of prophecy would no longer be confined to a small group of people whom God had specially chosen and anointed to speak on his behalf, as it was in days of old. But now he had poured out his spirit on all people who believe, young and old, men and women, so their sons and daughters, and they would be able to prophesy from that time forth. <clears throat> so we have to understand that we see a very, very important shift in the administration of the gift of prophecy at that point in the history of God's people. Now, we know, for example, that the prophetic ministry was widespread in the early congregations. And Paul designates prophecy as one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, verses uh, 7 to 11, he, and he teaches about it extensively. That's why it's worth a few sessions. He teaches about it extensively in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 to 40 where he begins, he begins this whole teaching on prophecy in tongues by encouraging believers to do what? To follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. I like that. Eagerly desire them. They haven't gone anywhere, friends. They haven't ceased to be. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. That is in the very first verse of 1 Corinthians 14. Eagerly desire the gifts, especially prophecy. And he goes on to say that believers, he says, in, uh, are to seek to prophesy so they can strengthen and they can encourage and they can comfort the body of Messiah. We are to seek to prophesy. That's in chapter 14, verse 3. You know, and it tells us again in Ephesians 4, in verses 7 to 13, he tells us that Messiah gave prophets along with apostles and evangelists and pastors and teachers as a special gift to the body of Messiah in order to equip us to serve him. We're given as a special gift, this gift. To, it's given to the prophets, the one who exercised, who exercised this gift very frequently and with accuracy and are used often in that regard. They've given been that gift to equip us to serve God better, to build us up spiritually. 
And we read much more about prophecy and the prophetic ministry of believers in the book of Acts. We learn, for example, of a, a band of prophets who travel from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them, by the name of Agabus, stands up in Acts 11, verse 28, and through the Spirit predicts that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. Now, for something very interesting happens here because it was on that basis of this prophetic word that the disciples in Antioch decided to provide help to their brothers who were living in Judea. And there's a lesson we have to learn here. You know, some people, they hear a prophecy, praise the Lord, hallelujah. What a wonderful prophecy. Wasn't it great to hear the word of the Lord today? But it doesn't go any further than that. And it was intended to go a lot further. The lesson we learn when we're given a prophetic word is we have to respond to it as God would have us do. In their case, they responded. They heard, oh, there's going to be a famine. And, you know, the congregation, the, the believers in Judea, they're going to suffer. They're going to need help. And so the people of Israel, unfortunately, you know, the scriptures record that we often fail to heed the prophetic directives that we receive from the prophets, and we paid the price for this. There's a line that I like. There's a verse that I like from 2 Chronicles 20, verse 20, and it was Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, who says to the people of Judah and Jerusalem when they're under attack by a huge army, and the prophet has told them, basically, don't worry. You're going to see what I'm going to do. He says in 2 Chronicles 20, 20, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. Well, we also know that the same Agabus who prophesied the famine later predicted Paul's imminent arrest. In Acts 21, verses 10 to 11. And I'll just read to you what Agabus said at the time. Because this is a very interesting little situation here. So Luke is writing after we had been there a number of days. In other words, the account of what's happening. A prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt tied his own hands and feet and said with it, the Holy Spirit says this, in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the, old, the owner of this belt and turn him over to the Gentiles. And let me tell you what's interesting here. And though Paul was warned both before and after Agabus' prophecy not to go down to Jerusalem, he went anyway believing it was the Lord's will for him to go, and indeed it was. He had planned to go to Rome, and as unlikely as it was, going to Jerusalem, almost getting killed by the mob there, getting arrested by the commander of the Roman garrison and his soldiers, and so on, turned out to be his ticket to get to Rome. And we're told, for example, in Acts 21, again, verses 8 and 9, that Philip, in whose house Paul stayed for quite a while before he encountered this Agabus, had four daughters who prophesied as well. But I just want to go back on this thing with Paul, because something happened to me just virtually within a half an hour before I started doing this teaching. A couple of months ago, we were walking in a large park near our house, and we met a young man, and as we were passing by him, Florence just said, Michael, we have to go and talk to him. So we went and we talked to him, and it turned out he was a believer, and he had a lot of, you know, ideas of his own. He wasn't part of a congregation and didn't seem to have any kind of oversight, but he was fascinated by biblical prophecy and so we got into a long talk it was a nice talk and we exchanged phone numbers and said we would be in touch with one another in the future well a couple of months have gone by and our life is busy perhaps his life is busy but all of a sudden 
today, I got um, a text from him. Now, he knows we're going back to Israel. He knows we live in Israel half the year. And he was warning me in his text not to go back. He basically said, look, there's going to be a war. Holy Spirit has shown me this. There's going to be a war. And you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't go back. You should stay here. Well, at any rate, I wrote him back and said, well, I am going. And then I quoted this whole story of, of Agabus, which is interesting because Agabus gives Paul a word of what's going to happen in Jerusalem. And even as he's going down, there's brothers, I think it's entire, who say the same thing. Paul, don't go. You're going to get into trouble there. And Paul says, look, I've got to go, even if it's going to cost me my life. Now, we remember that Paul had made a plan. He was going to go to Jerusalem, and then he was going to go to Rome. He wanted to bring the gospel in Rome. So God had shown the brothers he was going to have problems in Jerusalem. But Paul already knew he had to go to Rome. So the Holy Spirit had spoken in both cases. And one thing didn't cancel out the other, because in the end, everything the brothers said would happen, happened. But in the end, even as the Spirit of God had shown Paul, he was going to end up in Rome. So sometimes we only get part of the picture, not the whole picture. And that's what I told this young guy. I said, basically, I know I have to go back. Thank you for your warning. I appreciate it. But this story tells me that sometimes we both get a part of the picture not the whole picture. I said, but if I'm there and anything happens, my heart, of course, is that I can be helpful in some way. And so as we continue with this, we see that also Paul, who's doing most of his teaching here on prophecy, envisions these prophetic utterances being sometimes useful to instruct others, you might say. And I don't think he's speaking of a complete teaching here but rather of a short word, you might say, of instruction that's given by the Holy Spirit that's targeted specifically to an individual, a group of individuals that's relevant to their current situation, you know, to encourage them, to instruct them. And then it says here, you know, uh, about it. these utterances are useful for a lot of things he says in first corinthians 14 31 for you can all prophesy in turn all prophesy in turn so that everyone might be instructed and encouraged because sometimes a word of instruction will come forth and through that instruction people be encouraged or sometimes the gift of prophecy can serve as a means by which spiritual gifts are imparted to others you know someone might be praying for you and say and and the spirit of the lord shows them that god wants to give you a certain gifting one of those gifts could be prophecy could be healing could be any of those things and we see paul saying to timothy in first timothy 4 14 do not neglect the gift that was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Or, of course, people are going to be set in their ministries. And in Acts 13, verses 1 to 3, the Holy Spirit speaks to the prophets and teachers in Antioch to set Paul and Barnabas apart for their ministry among the nations, in the nations. Oh, hallelujah. I just want to, I lost my, my place here. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we have a question we can ask. Does the nature and function of prophecy in the new covenant, does it differ from that of the old covenant? And I'm going to speak about some of the similarities and differences in a shortened form and then end the session but I'll end my session today with this. <clears throat>
It seems that prophecy under both covenants functioned in essentially the same way. Thus, new covenant prophets received their revelations from God as old covenant prophets did. And what they declared was equal in authority uh, to the words, say, of Isaiah or Amos in the sense that they were God-given words, in the sense they were God-given words. And God had authorized them to speak them. Secondly, we see that the prophets under both covenants were mandated primarily to address God's people. You see, that's what you see in the Tanakh. That's what you see in the Brit Hadasha. But we see, for example, that Jonah, who went to Nineveh, and Daniel, who prophesied to kings and interpreted their dreams, even Joseph, who was not a prophet, they were notable exceptions. Thirdly, one might say that the central purpose of their ministries, you know, this is old covenant, new covenant, was to exhort God's people to trust God and encourage them to continue to obey his word. And how did they do this? By bringing these words of instruction, words of affirmation, words of warning, or words of correction when necessary. And when they did predict future events, it was always with a view to encouraging people to further trust and obey God. To do what? To help them to successfully navigate whatever it was that lay ahead. But warning them as well of the consequences that disregarding God's words would bring. These are some similarities. But in regard to differences, Unlike the gift of prophecy, which Joel too declared would be available to all New Covenant believers when God poured out his spirit in the last days, in the Old Covenant era, God only imparted his gift to those he'd specially chosen and anointed to be his spokespeople in the earth at that time. And the, the calling of Jeremiah is a perfect example. And again, we see it in Jeremiah. Chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, came to the prophet, saying, and he was just young at the time, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, and I ordained you a prophet to the nation. A second huge difference had to do with accuracy. My goodness me, we saw this before, didn't we? In the issue of accuracy. In the Old Covenant, the stakes were a lot higher for the prophets. We remember, I quoted this before, Deuteronomy 18.20 tells us that the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I've not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And we hear this warning repeated several times in the Hebrew scriptures. We see it in Jeremiah 14, verse 14 and 15, and Zechariah 13, verses 2 to 5. You speak falsely in my name, and you can die. Here's the quote from Jeremiah 14, verses 14 and 15. And the Lord said to me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them. I have not commanded them nor spoken to them. They prophesy to you a false vision, a divination, a worthless thing. And the, it's done in the deceit of their heart. Therefore, says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name, whom I did not send. Sword and famine shall be in this land. And by sword and famine shall those prophets who prophesy falsely be consumed. That's serious stuff. However, my friends, with the coming of the new covenant, it almost seems as if a certain leniency comes into play regarding prophecy. Inaccuracies are not treated with the same degree of severity as they were in Old Testament times. A lot of false prophets are still walking around. Those who prophesy falsely may, when they're exposed, may be disregarded, shunned, who knows what. 
corrected, but they're not put to death for what they did. And although, and I'll close with this, the spirit of the Lord still inspires prophetic revelation today. There is a recognition that it can sometimes come with error or human admixture. I'll say it again. Although the spirit of God still inspires prophetic revelation today, there's a recognition that it can sometimes come with error or human admixture. And that is why Paul says it must be judged. It must be weighed. It must be discerned to determine what is good and what is not. I'm going to close there today. I hope you've taken this in. I hope it was clear enough. If you have any questions, I guess you can relay them to me one way or another. I'll get them and try to answer them. So bless you guys, and I'll see you again next week. Shalom. May God grant you peace, my brothers and sisters. Bless you, keep you, shine upon you. In Yeshua's name, amen.